Well, good afternoon and welcome again. Thank you for joining us on today's installment of the Rework webinar series. On June 1st, Shanghai began to reopen after being in COVID lockdown for two and a half months. The lockdown had a significant impact on the local economy and China's real estate sector. Today, we'll talk through the reopening, China's economic stimulus policies, and provide an update on the property sector. A replay of the webinar with slides will be available on the Reorg webinar and podcast page within 24 hours for Reorg subscribers. Join me today are Catherine Shi, Distressed Debt Researcher, and Jingguang Tan, Director of Asia Credit Research. Catherine is based in Shanghai, has lived and worked through the lockdown, and experienced the reopening firsthand. She'll give us a front row view of what things are like in Shanghai. Jun Guang and his team of analysts have studied and written about China's real estate sector, have published in-depth analysis on dozens of developer names. After their presentations, Catherine and Jun Guang will take questions from the audience. Please submit questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A widget located on the bottom of your screen. Let's get started. So Catherine will go through some slides. Catherine, take it away. Thanks, Shasha. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Shu, and I work with Reorg as the distract debt researcher covering the real estate sector. And I'll be sharing some of the experience living and working throughout the Shanghai lockdown. So first thing, I want to share a timeline of the Shanghai lockdown to show you some of the major events happening in the city. So it all started on February 24th, which um, a new case of COVID was found in Shanghai. And then uh, shortly on March 12th, uh, Shanghai had moved the students' classes online. And then we see on um, um, the end of March and around early April, um, both sides of Shanghai, including the Pudong area and Pushi area are locked down. And um, immediately one day afterwards, the China has sent military power to help maintain the order of the city. And on April 5th, the daily cases of COVID have reached 10,000 people per day. And then to help rejuvenate the economy amidst the lockdown, so Shanghai had put out a new policy called the three-tier disease control system, which will divide the city into three different types. And for regions that does not have any reported case for 14 days, um, residents can actually leave their apartments. And, um, well, then to also stabilize the economy, on April 15, Shanghai has put out a wine list for 666 enterprises to initiate their productions. And eventually on June 1st, um, we saw that Shanghai has finally opened the phased reopening. And that's the time when I finally got out of my apartment for the first time in three months. And moving on to the next slide, I will show you some of the pictures taken during the lockdown. And um, to get you a sense of what life was like in Shanghai. So during the lockdown, one of the main issue is actually um, the food supply as well as medical care. And um, with the delivery services suspended, not only for food, but also for packages, uh, the only supply we got was actually from the government. And you can see on um, picture two is basically what you can get from the government, sometimes um, in four days or to a week. Uh, it's basically um, some protein, some rice, some vegetable, um, just the basic, uh, basic nutrition you need. And um, we also get three to five times of mandatory COVID test per week. And we do a lot of self-testing every day to ensure you don't carry the virus anywhere. So um, on picture one is um, shows the medical staff testing um, of the COVID in our neighborhood. And on um, picture three is showing how many um, self-testing we have done to ourselves. Um, and on the next slide, um, picture four shows you what highway looks like in Shanghai during the lockdown. So usually there's always traffic uh, traffic jam on the highway, but you can see literally this is like a ghost city among the lockdown. 
And uh, I guess you might wonder what is happening on picture five. Um, this is showing a hospital. Uh, you cannot really call it a hospital. We call it a Fangcang hospital. So basically you put people that have uh, little symptoms of the COVID um, into a very concentralized facility. Um, and after self-testing for positive for three to four days, then you can leave the facility. But you can see um, there's practically no secrets there. And um, the lights are actually on 24 hours per day. Um, so it was not a very pleasant experience. And um, then I'll show you some of the um, impacts on the Shanghai national economy resulting from the lockdown. So as you can see from the first chart, um, it shows China's April retail sales was down more than 11 points year over year. And um, the PMI index was also recorded down to 48 in March, which is the lowest point in 25 months. Um, and as China is a manufacturing led country, that would lead to a very increasing, uh, that would lead to increasing pressure for the economic downturn. And uh, for Shanghai itself, uh, it's also not looking very good because during the first, qu first quarter, the GDP only grew by 3.1%, um, which is 17.6% in the previous year. And um, for the first four months of um, this year, the retail sales was also down more than 14 points. Um, and the fixed asset investment was also down about 11 points. And especially for the property sector, um, the investments in the property development was down about 10 points. Um, and the construction area was down 47% for commercial and about 38% for the residential development. Um, next thing I will show you how China was putting out macroeconomic measures to combat the lockdown aftermath. So um, I've listed some of the significant events around from, um, from the beginning of April. Uh, we can see on April 25th, um, the PPOC has reduced the reserve requirement ratio for all banks um, by 25 BPs. So that will release um, 520 billion RMB to the market. And on May 20th, China also cut its five BR LPR rate by 15 basis points to 4.45, which means um, for the first house you buy, the lowest mortgage rate limit is now down to 4.25%. And then for the second house, um, the lower limit is 5.05%. And from the data we've gathered, um, banks in about 20 cities have so far lowered the limit, um, including cities like Suzhou, Jinan, and Tianjin. And then it comes to May 23rd, when the state council has issued uh, specific measures to help support the economy. And that was mainly targeting to stabilize the industrial and logistics supply chain and provide assistance to especially smaller firms and boost consumption. Um, for Shanghai itself, Shanghai also released uh, its own plan, um, about 50 uh, economic recovery measures to help stabilize the economy. So that would include some tax rebates, tax reductions, subsidies for not only um, enterprises, but also personnel. Um, and on May 31st, we see that the State Council finally pr provided the details uh, of the 33 measures, which include to add uh, about r and 140 billion value added tax credit refund, which is expected to, do, to be delivered in July. And the policy banks are expected to increase the credit line by another 800 billion to provide financial support for especially infrastructure building. Um, but um, for the real estate sector, some of the policy to help the industry, um, as we can first see, is the regulators. Um, so uh, what we reported before is that five private-owned developers um, are getting on the first list um, to issue new corporate bonds or media-term notes with the support from underwriters 
which will provide credit enhancement measures like CDS or CRMW um, to help with the issuance. Uh, as I assume you know that the five developers are C5 Group, Long Farm, um, Season Group, Country Garden, and Medea Real Estate. <clears throat> and specifically for the Shanghai New Action Plan, um, Shanghai has also vowed to provide support for the corporate bond filing and expedite the approval of real estate projects as well as land acquisitions. In other cities, we also see a loosening on the real estate policies, including um, reducing the down payment for your mortgage loans and also providing subsidies for buying homes and uh, lower the limit for purchasing homes or selling the homes. Um, and the mortgage rate, um, interest rate is also being reduced. And um, in a very challenging environment, we can also see that um, some state-owned enterprises are trying to um, uh, enter the private companies to acquire more shares uh, with the coordination of the local governments. So what's the overall impact on the property market? Um, following the favorable policies putting out, um, we see that more than 150 cities across China have lifted their restrictions um, and the first, first time home mortgage rates actually was down to 4.4% um, at about 20 cities as of May 19th. And uh, Shanghai, excitingly, they arranged the first land auction since the lockdown um, this month, but the participations are still mostly central government-owned enterprises or state, uh, state background enterprises. We do not see much uh, private developers actually participating in the land auction. And nationwide, um, the home buyer's demand does not seem an overall growth. And um, we expect there's gonna be a 20% decline in housing sales, uh, housing sales for the first half of 2022. And for most cities, uh, we can expect a gradual recovery during the second half of this year. Um, so due to various um, elements and also the lockdown, uh, we also see that developers are still resorting to their liability management exercise, such as extension and consult consent solicitation. Um, we have the very famous Greenland case, which is the Shanghai government-backed owned enterprise um, seeking uh, extension for their offshore notes and Jiangsu Zhongnan Construction um, conducting exchange offer for their offshore notes, and Jinko Property um, doing an uh, extension for their onshore corporate bond, and Zhongnan Holdings exchange offer for the offshore notes, and Sunex China's uh, missing offshore coupon payment, and also extending the onshore corporate bond. So um, my colleague JT is going to provide some data and statistics for the China property market. Thank you, Catherine, uh, for your observations and insights. I think some of the things you mentioned clearly uh, brought back memories of what we experienced in 2020 in, in other parts of the world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you for taking the time to join us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Jun Guang, and I'll be giving you uh, some further updates on uh, China property as a second part of uh, today's session. Uh, my update will consist of three parts. I will very briefly touch on developers' uh, liability management exercise, uh, financial market spreads, as well as some high-level operating figures. Now, uh, some members of the audience who who joined us uh, in the previous occasion, uh, you may recall in our last webinar, we had this very extensive di discussion on uh, developers liability management exercise or LME in short. And I would like to give you a couple of quick points on this topic, which we um, expect to remain highly uh, relevant for the next few months uh, because of the maturity war that's coming up in July and August, as you can see from the chart on the left. Uh, since slightly over a month ago, three out of the top five developers that we have identified with large maturity walls uh, that hadn't uh, announced a default or restructuring have now appointed advisors uh, to work with them through various offshore and onshore maturity extensions. Uh, I think what's very notable to us here is that Sunak being one of the top three or, or top four 
uh, private developers or what we call POE developers is also seeking a comprehensive restructuring solution. Uh, this is most likely going to be done via a scheme in the coming days in our view. Uh, on the other hand, as uh, Catherine alluded to earlier as well, Greenland Holdings, uh, one of the largest SOE linked or SOE local SOE owned developers held by uh, no less uh, the Shanghai SASAC uh, also successfully went through, uh, as we saw this morning, a, a consent solicitation process for their due June 25, uh, 500 million notes. Uh, we have given some views on this particular consent solicitation process and some uh, analysis as well. So please reach out to us uh, after this if you are keen to uh, explore Greenland further. Uh, so uh, with these two names, what this goes to show uh, is that even the largest SOE or largest and, and largest PE developers uh, have been very significantly affected by this uh, unprecedented market downturn and, and, and really no one is safe, right? Uh, and when we look ahead, uh, so now I think uh, one of the names that we are very closely monitoring is KWG. Uh, I would say this is um, one of the higher quality, higher developers on our coverage. Uh, it's also a name that we have recently published a long form test sheet analysis on. Uh, for KWG, we think that there are various support factors um, that could enable uh, this developer to meet, it, meet its uh, 900 million September maturities uh, for the offshore notes. And we also think that its onshore liquidity conditions, uh, liquidity condition is um, relatively better than some of its peers. Uh, so once again, uh, feel free to reach out to us if, if, if you'd like to discuss any of these names on, on the right hand side of the slide. Next, please. So now let's uh, switch gears a bit and return our attention to some um, financial and uh, macro indicators. Uh, now, a very quick caveat over here at Rio, uh, uh, we are not so much macro, macro analysts and, and I myself, I'm not an economist by, tr by training, uh, but some of the indicators here are some high level uh, trends and statistics that we monitor as we check in on the uh, on the market's pulse periodically, and, and, and it's really for general discuss, dis, discussion purposes for, for today's webinar. Now, uh, if I can direct your attention to the left-hand side of the slide, what we have here is the BOFA Asia dollar uh, higher corporate China issue index, where uh, the, the, the property sector accounts for a large part of the index at around, you know, call it say 70, 75% of the issuances there. Um, as you can see, the index is still showing a very high level of financing stress offshore. Uh, as credit spreads, as measured by uh, OAS or option adjusted, option adjusted spreads, uh, uh, it's, it's still very elevated at more than 2,000 basis points. So our read of this is that while, while credit spreads remain very high by historical standards, um, the market seems to be finding a more stable footing since uh, March the 16th, which marked the high point of OAS spread levels at more than 3,000 basis points. Now, I, I'm sure many of the... Uh, listeners today would recall that this is also the day when uh, Vice Premier Liu He, uh, he spoke publicly to try to reassure markets and since then uh, spreads have gradually uh, grinded downwards even though on an absolute basis they still remain very very high. So the most recent OAS spread, uh, well the last I checked today is still slightly below uh, the 200 day uh, moving average line and, and, and to us I think this points to perhaps a slightly more stable footing as what we saw over the last, you know, call it six to eight weeks for uh, China high yield uh, developers and corporates moving forward. Now, on the right-hand side, uh, this chart here really provides a more granular perspective of, of the financial market stress, uh, but in a slightly different way, right? It's, it's essentially a histogram. And if you were to focus on the rate bars of the histogram, what that tells us is that around, call it, 50-60% of the approximately 250 offshore higher issuances that we track daily at Rio, it's now pri it's, it's priced at around 30 cents on the dollar and below. So clearly the market still remains very stressed, not, notwithstanding a, 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 a trend of stabilization of OAS spreads. Next slide, please. So moving away from financial markets, uh, we see that the stress is also closely mirrored on the operational front as... Um, so what we have here is 35 developers with high yield dollar issuances that we track closely every month. And I think um, the operating statistics uh, look really grim to us as well. Uh, we thought that the first quarter of this year was uh, really, really challenging. Uh, but clearly, um, April, May, uh, they were even worse in terms of 
uh, contracted sales for developers, especially uh, if, we, if we think about it in the recent context of the last two years. Uh, so contracted sales for this sample of developers with dollar issuances, um, it's down by you know, 65, 66% year on year. Uh, now, with the reopening that Catherine mentioned earlier, we are a bit more hopeful about June's, uh, June's uh, stats. Uh, but, you know, let's see if our hopes are, uh, are going to be founded. Uh, so when we decompose the uh, contracted sales chart on the left to the two charts on the right-hand side, uh, what we see is that developers are, are losing both um, pricing power and volume traction in this market at the same time. So what that means is that you know, cash collection, well, cash collection from contracted sales, um, it tends to be one of the largest, if not the largest contributor to uh, developers operating cash flow or OCF. So this plunge in contracted sales uh, is definitely going to weigh very heavily on developers, notwithstanding, you know, uh, policy easing uh, that's going to be uh, coming up. Uh, next slide, please. So when we take a step back and uh, not just focus on these uh, develop, high, high yield uh, developers with dollar issuances and, and, and consider nationwide statistics, uh, what we are seeing is that um, um, what we are seeing is that um, contracted sales on a nationwide level has also plunged by um, fifty percent year over year, as you as you can see from the blue chart on on the top half. Uh, the May figures seem to be an improvement, but it's still, you know, 30 plus 40 percent decline that we're talking about. So despite ASP cards, um, volume, volume sales in terms of area, in terms of GS, GFA as seen by the, by the, by the chart in red is, is down by, you know, more than 40 percent in, in recent months. And what these two uh, trends indicate to us is that property, the property market is really, really demand constrained right now. And... Uh, anything the government can do to try to boost um, bias sentiment, such as the uh, fairly recent five-year LPR cut that Catherine mentioned earlier, uh, should be really helpful, uh, as we have seen in the past. But I think the effects this time around remains to be seen in the next few months. Next, please. So aside from uh, sales figures, we also consider um, construction stats to gauge operating activity levels. And as you can see from the charts here, the trend is also very clearly negative. And we think this partly uh, also reflects uh, developers' working capital constraints. Uh, so construction starts is easily down, you know, more than 40% more, more than forty percent year on year in, in recent months. Uh, and, and on a related note, we also think it's worth paying attention to uh, some other very closely related uh, statistics like steel usage. Uh, as, a as, a, as a coincident indicator to see if there might be an inflection point on construction activity and therefore the, the broader real estate industry. Next, please. Now, finally, we also um, consider land sales uh, because as, as, as many of you would know, um, um, a developer's land bank and, and um, its replenishment of the land bank is one of the most important uh, operating indicators uh, Come right. If you look at the, the, the chart in red, what that tells us is that development activity, activity is likely to um, slow down uh, very significantly in the short to medium term as land sales uh, to developers via auctions have, have, have slowed down by a lot. Right. The, the sharp con this very sharp contraction in developers' uh, land banking activity uh, to us would also point to very sluggish contracted sales in the next, um, call it 10 to 18 months. Uh, especially if the market remains as um, demand constrained as it is, right? Uh, this would also mean uh, that a key source of uh, operating cash flow for developers uh, as derived from contracted sales, right, from new launches is also um, unlikely to improve uh, significantly in the near term. Uh, next, please. Uh, so lastly, I just want to very quickly highlight a dozen long-form analysis that my team and I have uh, recently put out on various uh, China developers. And, and I think the half a dozen or so names indicated here uh, it covers a fairly broad spectrum of quality and stress levels uh, in, this, in this sector. Uh, and well, beyond China property, we have also uh, very recently considered credits that could be interesting from uh, a reopening point of view as well. So uh, I'll urge you to reach out to us if you'd like to find out more. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Shasha. Thank you so much, Jingguang and Catherine for a presentation. It's really interesting with first, first-hand experience and also in-depth. 
analysis as well. We do have a question coming from the audience, um, which is, when do you think the China real estate sector will recover? Before we get to that, Catherine, if I could ask you, you'd mentioned in your presentation, on June 1st, it was the first time that you ever left your apartment um, for two and a half months. So what you did on that day, do you still remember? I, I go shopping. <laughs> uh, groceries or, or something um, else? Shopping malls are open for June 1st, um, but restaurants are still closed. So far, restaurants are still not allowed to um, die in. You can order takeout in the shopping malls. So there's there's like people waiting in line to buy Louis Vuitton bags in the shopping mall. So I guess it's a big consumption day for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so going back to the question from the audience, when do you think the China real estate sector will recover? Catherine, do you want to um, take a stab at that? Um, sure. Um, I think currently we did see um, some recovery um, around the lower tier cities of the property sales, um, but the overall property sales remained weak. And um, despite the loosening of the policy and the home construction, which would reflect people's willingness to buy the houses um, has also did not show any real improvement. Um, I think the thing here is that the COVID restriction is becoming a no new normal and um, people are worried that any time in the day they can be in lockdown and sent in a hotel for 14 days. And um, many households are also expecting their spending to be cut down. And um, I think it depends on the future policy about whether more relaxation on the property sector is coming. And so far we did not see much improvement on the housing property sales. And many people, um, I some of them are speculating that the housing prices might drop in the future. Um, some of those people's rapid, um, household incomes are getting cut, so they wouldn't choose to buy a house. And some people are concerned that um, what happens if they buy a developer that defaulted on their debt and leaving the construction suspended. So that's all the elements um, that putting households, um, home buyers demand on hold. Um, and one other thing I think is that the implication of the loosening of pre-sales escrow accounts, and it has not been implemented nationwide so far. Um, so for the overall real estate developer, um, they are still waiting for the housing sales to go up as well as the um, escrow account funding to be released in order to survive for the long term. I see. And I would say, I personally, I think there's gonna be a recovery in the second half of the year, but um, not a very drastic change. Mm -hmm. and, and in what fashion would the recovery take um, specifically? Do you think the state-owned, developers will sort of lead the recovery as opposed to privately held? Um, yes, I, I think it's a chain effect. Um, so um, more land auction and more acquisitions, and then the sales of the state-owned enterprises go up, and then um, their financing channels are opened then they would get the money to acquire the projects from the more distressed developer and help them to revitalize their own projects. So I think it should start it with the SOEs. Mm -hmm. Some people say the impact of the lockdown is just local or regional, or it only affects Shanghai. You know, they say, take the real estate sector, for example, um, only affected developers whose headquarters are in Shanghai, some people say. Catherine, do you agree with that? Mm, I think the impact is way beyond Shanghai. So first thing, many cities near Shanghai, like in Jiangsu province or in Zhejiang province, they have also suffered um, a shock from the COVID lockdown. And there we can see that um, data in Zhejiang province 
province, their retail sales and their fixed asset investment data was also dropping a lot in April. And um, nationwide, we have also had like Shenzhen, Beijing, or Hebei province who found, found like COVID cases and got the cities into lockdown. And uh, one thing I want to flag is that it's not only becoming very difficult to travel between the cities, but also for many businesses, um, supply chain becomes a main issue. And um, from my personal experience and what I heard, it's now very challenging to make sure an enterprise is normal operation, because if your suppliers are located um, in various regions and they can properly be in lockdown in any moment, uh, it's gonna be causing some panic for you. So I think it's a nationwide impact. Okay, and now that Shanghai has started this phased reopening, we've read reports about the government reinstalling some of the quarantine lockdown measures in parts of the city. It looks like China, uh, Shanghai's road towards reopening is full of twists and turns. What are you seeing firsthand in terms of how the reopening is playing out? Um, I think there's um, so there's a lot of panic in the city. They're concerned that they will be back in their own apartment for another one month. But so far, um, I've seen that um, the districts are quite divided. And um, I think a small portion of the city are in lockdown so far. Um, but um, they're taking a less um, act like a lot less violent or a uh, nice proactive way um, to put people in lockdown. And the efficiency is increasing. And um, most people are in normal business routines and the um, construction and the um, business operations are remaining normal and the consumption is normal as well. So there's no, not a very large scale lockdown so far. Right. Well, let's all hope that China will, Shanghai will not go back to full lockdown. Um, yeah. Jingle, moving on to you. Um, the real estate sector, which you and your team have covered for a while, had faced challenges long before the COVID lockdown. So what are you seeing as some of the major challenges the sector had faced back then? Yeah, um, so Shasha, that's, that's a good question. And... I, I think I, I guess our experiences are probably not as uh, interesting as, as Catherine's, but I'm going to try to give a, a good response to that. Um, so you talk about challenges um, before the lockdown, right? And um, we think that there are really, you know, various factors that are that are intertwined, uh, even even before the lockdown, right? Uh, so this included things like policy tightening, as we have seen with the pre-sales escrow account restrictions. Uh, Abroad, well, abroad in general, shutdown essentially of the capital markets that that has prevented refinancing of, of dollar debt, right, for these developers, and deleveraging pressures uh, as brought about by the three rate lines when it was instituted in, I believe, sometime around August 2020, and and we have seen that um, that has uh, resulted in its own very perverse balance sheet effects where there are all these off balance sheet debts. Uh, Coming up, I think yesterday we reported on a uh, on a four hundred million uh, Shimao private note uh, that was hitherto you know not not known right, and also a general uh, weakening of investment demand right uh, in real estate because the government said housing is for living and, and not for speculation, and 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 I think they've gone about trying to do that by rolling out things like property tax trials in, in uh, some major cities, right? So those are some of the, those challenges that come to mind. Okay. Are you still on? Okay, yep. great. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. Great. Can you hear me? <laughs> so, yes, yes. Yep. Okay. So as a follow-up question, right? Oh, okay, how, yep. Yeah, as a follow-up question, how has the lockdown exacerbated the, the sector's issues or affected its recovery? Sure. Um, so uh, I think a few things a few things come to mind. Um, well, people can't visit showrooms for one, right? Or in the case of secondary sales, they can't see for themselves the, the apartment or the property that they wish to buy, right? Uh, but I think one thing that is worth uh, note, one thing that is worth uh, pointing out from our perspective at least is that this lockdown 
uh, as opposed to the 2021 uh, appears uh, somewhat different because we are seeing a, a, a somewhat slower recovery uh, even as reopening momentum gathers pace and as movement restrictions are eased. So that to us suggests that buyer sentiments in general are, are really weak, right? And perhaps people are sensing um, some kind of paradigm shift in, in real estate, right? Especially uh, in so far as a as, as, as form of investment, right? Such that over the medium to long term, uh, maybe there is a worry that the government could continue to crack down again on the sector and uh, apply pressure on, on pricing. Uh, and I guess it also doesn't help, as, as Catherine mentioned earlier, it doesn't help that, you know, uh, people are anticipating some kind of rolling lockdown, lockdowns in the days ahead, and, and therefore uh, the economy is likely to stay weak and, and prices are likely to stay weak. I, I hope that kind of answers this question, Chesha. Yeah, it does. Thank you, Jungo. We've got some questions coming in from the audience. Um, the first one, you think, do you think Sino Ocean will end up like Greenland? Thanks. That's a really interesting <laughs> question. Sino Ocean. Um, Catherine, do you want to take a stab at this and then Jungo, we can uh, go to you if you have a follow up thoughts on that one. Um, I mean, for Greenland and Sino Ocean, what they have in common is that they both have um, shareholder support, which are um, state-owned background, um, and um, out of expectations, I think Shanghai government did not offer the help for Greenland. And for Sino Ocean Group, I think we should also look at how supportive is their um, shareholder China Life. And um, since China Life has also done some management ma management member change. Um, what a question you need to think is that is the new leader willing to provide the support to Sign the Ocean Group? And um, I heard that Sign the Ocean uh, Group also got um, some member change from China Life. And um, if China Life decided to continue to do that, I think that will show um, they still care about the company and they will still offer some help. Um, but um, even if it's not very material funding help, it shows a signal. Um, so far, I don't think Sino Ocean is going down like Greenland so far, but um, as long as the supportive vanish, um, it's going to be quite difficult for them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. The next one is probably also for Catherine. Um, it asks about intra uh, province travel. Um, mm -hmm. Just to check, currently there's still requirement that people doing intra-province travel to be su subjected to compulsory quarantine. I heard people mentioning that, but I'm not sure how the situation is like. Um, Catherine, do you have any color on that? Sure. Um, so practically for Shanghai, because we are a high risk region, we have to, um, if we travel to any other cities, uh, we have to be in lockdown for seven to 14 days until getting out um, the, the quarantine facility. And so that depends on the level of risk you come uh, of the region you come from and also the uh, local district's own policies. Okay. Usually seven days, yeah. Okay, great. The next one is some large POE developers such as Country Garden said that their bank funding is still normal. Do you think that's true? Catherine, do you want to take a stab at this one? Um, Some of I, the large privately owned developers like a country garden. Yeah. Um, by bank funding, I assume you mean that the bank, the bank, bank is not sure. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I think um, for policy banks, um, since like Country Garden was among the white list, um, with the help from the Shanghai Stock Exchange and regulator to issue a new bond in the um, open market, um, and um, other policy banks are ordered to pro to maintain a smooth financing channel for their development loans and other um, and other like mortgage loans. So I think um, from a the, the bank's financing channel perspective, their financing window is still. Uh, remains in normal order. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question from the audience. This one has to do with a commercial or retail real estate. Um, how has the sector been affected by the lockdown and what's China's overarching zero 
COVID strategy affecting the commercial and the retail sector. For instance, Dalian Wanda, small properties and upcoming maturities. Um, Jingguan or Catherine, do we have any color on this? So we talk about the residential real estate sector. So um, this um, uh, audience member was wondering about the retail or commercial sector. Do we have any insight on that one? I think Catherine, earlier during the uh, webinar, you mentioned a bit about the broad-based uh, retail slowdown. So I think clearly that would have uh, spillovers to the retail sector, right? And I think just judging from some of the more recent earnings releases that uh, we have come across, one of the things that we've been trying to pick up is to see if some of these um, you know, commercial properties uh, have gone through some kind of uh, impairment charge by the auditors, especially. Uh, but so far, it hasn't been the case, right? Um, I think in some instances, we still see, well, I guess partly because of the lockdown and partly because administratively things have just kind of been jammed up well occupancy rates for some of the higher tier properties well the higher tier retail properties they are still holding up fairly well uh i haven't really had a chance to look at some of talian mm -hmm. commercial properties but i think a recent one that came to mind was uh catherine i think uh, for example sino ocean right in Chengdu, the Tai uh, commercial property. Well, I mean, I think occupancy as of the as, as of what the company has mentioned is still north of ninety percent, right? So, I'm guessing the impact would gradually be felt, right? And uh, you'll probably see uh, this particular subsector weaken in in the coming months. Uh, yeah. So, I guess ho hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Catherine, do we have anything else to add on that one? Um, where should we go to? Jingguan, with that mm. as a segue, I'd like to circle back to um, the reopening. You know, sure. the, we touched on it. The reopening is really fraught with uncertainty and regression. How does that affect the real estate sector's operational and liquidity outlook? Well, well, Shasha, that's a, not a very broad question. Um, let me try my best on this. Um, so. I think one, as, as we pointed out during the, the, the presentation earlier, uh, we think the property sector is extremely demand constrained at the moment, especially as far as residential is concerned. And anything the government can do in, in terms of monetary policy or macro potential policy uh, should be very helpful if the past uh, was, if the past is any indication for, for today, right? Um, I think a few things that we are paying very close attention to would be uh, further cuts to, for example, the five-year LPR rate, right? That would uh, improve the affordability of homes. And I think this was probably in 2015, uh, when five-year LPR rates were cut quite significantly, we did see an improvement in demand, right? Uh, other macro potential policies would then include um, LTV ratios, but th this tends to be uh, very granular on the city level. And, and the easing of pre-sales uh, escrow account policies, amongst other things, right? The latter is something that we have paid uh, very close attention to. And, and we've, in fact, put out research on uh, pre-sales escrow account policies that uh, discusses uh, the key supervision fund uh, requirements and the general supervision fund requirements for the top 10 uh, cities in, in, in China. So if, if anyone is interested, uh, in that kind of detail, please, you know, reach out to us after this webinar. Yeah, we've got some very good questions coming from the audience. So for everyone who's watching it, you're looking, uh, you're watching Reorg webinar on Shanghai reopening, and we're also providing an update on China's real estate sector. If you would like to ask questions anytime during the presentation of the webinar, please use the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. Uh, one note though, we cannot comment on any rumors or speculations. Um, and we normally do not uh, provide projections either. Um, Jingguo, um, I have oh. another one for you. On a sure. forward-looking basis, what operational metrics are we looking at to gauge the real estate sector's future cash flow? Okay, okay. Uh, good question. There are a few. Uh, so, you know, cash collection from uh, pre-sales tend to be one of the biggest contributors to a developer's OCF um, alongside 
uh, movement in certain working capital items such as uh, such as trade payables. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the thing is, we think that the latter, as far as as, as uh, extending payables is concerned, is more or less maxed out given industry con uh, given industry con conditions, and uh, contractors are are, are fairly uh, stressed as well, right? And the former, when it comes to cash collection from pre-sales, um, I think in the short to medium term, right, call it 10 to 18 months, it's also unlikely to pick up very significantly as well because, you know, as, as, as you saw from the uh, weak land sales um, uh, data that we showed earlier, right, that would translate to uh, weak primary launches and therefore uh, weak pre-sales uh, in the days to come, right? A key aspect then therefore would be uh, what had what's already happened, right? Namely, um, the cash that's already been collected from previous pre-sales, right? And a key aspect of this would uh, be the easing of uh, uh, pre-sales uh, escrow account restrictions, right? For which we have seen some easing, uh, especially in lower tier cities, right? Um, uh, I believe there will, there will be the likes of, say, Zhaoqing or, or, or Chengdu. Or the, these are a couple that comes to my mind. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jungba. Sure. We've got one last question from the audience. Do you have any concern about season groups liquidity position and its ability to repay its debt for the next six to 12 months? Um, Catherine, do you want to take a stab at this one and then Jungba? Um, I think season group, um, first thing they got to the whitelist for the onshore corporate bond issuance and they also have falling bond insurance plan in line. Um, so overall, I think their current liquidity will be fine and their commercial assets um, have good quality. Um, so from like standing from a current point, because I cannot really project what's gonna happen in a one year and be entirely accurate. Um, I think um, with their um, financing window open as well as what we see they did issue the offshore notes, um, I think around the end of May, um, with the support for, from their family office and also high tone securities. Um, that means they have both onshore and offshore financing window open so far. And um, I think their financial standing is better um, than the other de developers so far. Okay, great. Jungwa, do we have any uh... Um, yeah, so uh, season uh, is not something that we've we've had uh, initiated and the coverage on, but it's it's definitely something that is on our plate. So uh, reach out to us because uh, we are likely to put out something in the next uh, month or two, and we're more than happy to share our findings uh, once we have that in depth uh, research done on this new. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Jinglon and Catherine. Um, I see no further questions from the audience. Um, that's all the time we have for today's webinar session. As a reminder, Reorg is a global provider of credit intelligence data analytics for law firms, investors, and advisors. If you are already a subscriber, send any questions to customer success at reorg.com. And remember, a replay will be available on the Reorg webinar and podcast page within two business days. A big thank you for everyone who joined us today, as well as to our panelists, Catherine Shi and Jun Tan. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.